Hey there, it's Raleigh. I want to catch you before this episode to tell you about our new and improved bonus podcast, More Mercy. Each week, I break down a Mercy Cast episode and show how it not only intersects with Scripture, but how it impacts our daily lives. This short devotional episode is only $3 a month, which is like $4 less than a cup of coffee at the Mermaid Place. To access it, all you have to do is click the link in the show notes. Remember, no matter what you're going through, there's always more mercy. And now, on with the show. And welcome back to the Mercy Cast, where we are learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I'm your host, Raleigh Sadler. All of us face some form of loss, whether it's a loss of a job, the loss of a friendship, or a deep feeling of loss that we may not know where it's coming from at that moment. But there are few experiences of loss that compare to losing a child. Many of my friends have experienced miscarriages and none of them know where to go. Oftentimes, they don't really even know how to talk about it. They don't really know how to understand what happened to them. And so in this isolation, they can retreat into themselves for fear that no one will be able to understand what they're going through. Rachel's parenthood journey started with pregnancy loss. In her pain, she realized there were few resources and places to open up about her story. Today, I'm joined by Rachel Lohman, who is the founder of Hope Again Collective, a handmade jewelry line that shares the stories of moms who've gone through pregnancy and infant loss. She's also the author of Miscarried Hope. Rachel, thanks for joining me on the Mercy Cast. Glad to be here with you, Raleigh. In your story, you experienced what so many parents go through, and you were right there with them. You didn't know where to go. You were having a hard time unpacking it by yourself, and you really didn't seem to have anyone coming around you. What did you do next as you're trying to process the loss that you've experienced? The season that followed my loss, it was very disorienting. And the area that I struggled with the most, I think, was was my faith. And there are so many things packed into that. So it didn't just feel like the loss of a child. It obviously was that. But as time went on, I realized there were so many secondary losses, as is common with most forms of grief. Right. But I just had no idea, A, that miscarriage would become a part of our story, but that I would have changed relationships with so many different facets of my life, really, in so many ways. So what I did, I I, I didn't have much to do, to be honest, in the time. I sat with a, a therapist who was phenomenal, and she was a lost mom herself, which I didn't know until I had this experience. And I had already been a client of hers prior. And just having somebody who was a trusted resource, who was a little bit further down the road than I was in a safe space, be able to process the mix of emotions that I would feel, you know, you're feeling afraid to hope, to dream about your future. I was even feeling a little bit afraid to trust God with these desires to be a mom and to to try all of this again. It just felt so weighted with vulnerability and risk. So having my therapist there was such a huge resource. And when I look back in hindsight, I'm not sure that I would be in the place that I am today with my faith and with the honor being able to come alongside women and and help them through their own healing early in loss if I hadn't had my therapist very early on to kind of hold my hand and walk me on the road that she had already walked. You talk about this idea of secondary loss, and I think Mm -hmm. that is something that is lost on a lot of us. We don't think about the other things that kind of happened in conjunction. Yes. And so you talk about you experienced a hit to your faith, kind of a Mm -hmm. loss of faith. Tell me more about that. Sure. Yeah, well, secondary losses that I most commonly hear that accompany pregnancy and infant loss, a change relationship with your faith. I even have women who have told me I am not a person of faith but I'm finding myself curious for the first time or wishing that I had some set of higher beliefs to ground myself in this time of suffering. So it's even really interesting how it works on the flip. I think it's one of those things of suffering puts us in a place where we are asking like the deeper aches of the heart for the first time. Those are kind of bubbling up to the surface. 
So that was a big one for me. I was navigating a changed relationship with hope. I suddenly was feeling like there was a disconnect with my own body. I knew that, you know, God had created my body a certain way and that I'm supposed to be able to carry life. And so it was very confusing and there were waves of betrayal feeling like my body had betrayed me. It didn't do what it was created to do. Now, obviously there are a lot of nuances in that. And, but I I do bring that up. It's an important point because it's one that a lot of women struggle with after pregnancy and infant loss, but they often feel uncomfortable talking about, but you suddenly start to feel like, is my body safe for, for babies, for new life? That was one, you have a changed relationship with your friends and family too. A lot of women feel very unsupported, sadly, after they experience a loss like this, because usually the social circle doesn't know what to do. And that can result in just retreating. They don't acknowledge the baby. They don't ask questions. You know, the first anniversary of of when the, the mom um, and the father lost their child goes and passes and there's no acknowledgement. There are a lot of simple things that family and friends can do to be intentional to support a lost mom and lost parents. But I think there's just not a lot of, of education out there right now. And so people, out of fear of saying the wrong thing, don't say anything. So it really feels like internally, externally, spiritually, emotionally, there are so many secondary losses. And yeah, I just think that's an important piece to to name and to be able to talk about. And it sounds very holistic as well. It's not mm-hmm. that one thing is happening, but you're being hit on many different fronts. Right, right. And it's probably really difficult to handle when you feel isolated and alone in a moment where your suffering is a fever pitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're expected, you know, to return to work after your three bereavement days and the world around you. I mean, you just have to jump back into it. You you have to go grocery shopping. You're surrounded by pregnant women, little babies, celebrations, pregnancy announcements, baby shower invites. And I know that can be a really difficult thing to navigate, especially when your loss is fresh. And I think it's also important to say the pain that a lost mom might be feeling does not take away from you know, the joy that you want to feel in celebrating a stranger or a friend or somebody else who is able to have a baby and to be pregnant. But it's just such a sensitive, delicate balance. You want to be able to celebrate this beautiful thing happening for somebody, but your heart is so broken uh, and you're just reminded of what you lost. So yeah, it is, it is just very complex. I think it's one of the most unique forms of loss because our society doesn't really know what to do with it. I've had so many friends talk to me in, in just a very confidential way. They're like, hey, I don't know what to do with these feelings. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, tell me more. And they're like, okay, so I'm really glad that my sister-in-law is pregnant, but I just lost my child and I don't yeah. know how to feel. Like I, yeah. I, 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 I'm excited for them, but I also feel so much pain mm-hmm. and I don't know who to talk to. And in these moments, you know, I don't really have an answer. Mm-mm. Can't fix it. I, I would love to. That would be awesome if I had just the magic pill. All I can do, though, is be present in that moment and say, you know, I, this is not the way it was supposed to be. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly. And I'm here. I, I don't know what to do, but I can stumble around and be your friend. <laughs> I, can, I can be that. But yeah, I think your experience as you share it, I can see why you started Hope Again Collective, because though your story is unique, there are also parts of your story that I feel like we we hear from many mm-hmm. who do all the right things. You know, they meet the right person. They meet the person they're going to commit to. They have the wedding. They're in love. They get pregnant. Mm-hmm. They wait long enough to tell people because right. they want to be careful. And then something happens and they don't know what to do. And I feel like this is a common story, but most of my friends who've gone through it, they seem to have very few avenues through which to mm-hmm. talk about it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes shame comes. Sometimes there is a loss of faith. Like, God, why did you allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. If you love the little children, then why not my child? Right. And you described this idea of a changed relationship with faith, but you also described this changed relationship with hope. Mm -hmm. 
what did hope look like afterwards? Yeah, that, that was a huge struggle point. And that really is what my book, Miscarried Hope, is born out of, is this premise of hope is miscarried along with mm. your child. And I think for me, I never really paused to assess what role hope played in my life. It was just kind of always there. I would call myself an optimistic person. I love to dream, think about the future. So hope had just been there. Um, and I and I had been through challenges and losses before, but nothing rattled my hope like walking through pregnancy and infant loss did. And I think it might be because it's just such a personal sense of loss. Like it happens within your own body. And you are then grieving someone that you deeply love, but have never met and know that you will never meet this side of eternity. So there's so many questions and question marks that live in that storyline. But it really caused me to to pause and to look at hope for the first time. And especially in writing Miscarried Hope, look at, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus. We talk about hope a lot. We toss it around, but it just feels kind of like flippant. You know, how does the hope of the resurrection actually change? my story and how I process this loss. And through time and processing this, I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, hope makes all the difference in the way that I view this story. Because of Jesus' defeat of death, hope is in my baby's story now, and death is not the last word. And because I have the hope of heaven, I know I'm going to get to meet my child one day Mm. and see them and learn about their personality and have some of those question marks that I will live with answered. And I I feel like I, I understand hope in a practical sense now, like I get to live it out versus prior to loss, this type of loss. Yeah, it's just more of like an ideal, it, you know, it just kind of floated around like, okay, that, that sounds great and the hope of heaven, all that stuff. But I feel like God has invited me into a concrete outworking of, of what biblical hope looks like for us now in a fallen world. You experience the loss as devastating as what you went through, and it's very easy to feel like all hope is gone. Mm -hmm. Like, why go forward? You can't trust God in that moment. You can't trust your body. Mm -hmm. You probably feel betrayed at a metaphysical level as well as a physical level. Right. And you start digging in. And what was the process for you of Maybe not regaining hope because you said that this caused you to look at hope for the first time. I wonder sometimes if we just assume that we know what hope is, Mm -hmm. but we don't really have to depend on it until until we have to. And like you, you talk about looking at it for the first time. Describe that process to us. It looked a lot like the opposite of hope (laughs) Mm. as I went through the process. And I didn't like the fact that it felt messy and there there wasn't a roadmap for me to follow, so to speak. We talk a lot, I think, culturally about like the five stages of grief, but I didn't have any language or steps to follow, so to speak, to, to recover my hope. And that's actually something that I've developed and that lives in my book, Miscarried Hope. It are the five stages of hope that I've seen now that I'm a few years out from loss. So what that looked like for me was just a lot of lamenting before God, letting out my anger, doubts, questions, frustrations, such an honest period of my walk with Jesus. And I hadn't had that before. Mm. I just hadn't had that. Again, I had been through losses before, but nothing had sent me. I mean, I remember just laying on the rug and we had like a little 800 square foot home and just laying on the rug in the family room, crying out to God, hearing my husband play that song, King of My Heart, in the background, which says, you are good, good. And I was just like, I don't know how to believe that, God. I want to believe that. But I, and it, it was frustrating to me that he was singing along to that song and humming it out. And he just seemed to be in a different place. Like he, he could grasp that what we were going through sucked and was really awful. But he was still clinging up here to like this goodness of God that surpassed it all. And I wasn't there. 
as you talked about earlier, I very much subscribe to this idea of like doing the right thing, you know, checking off those boxes in right. life. And like, if you're a good person, a good Christian, whatever it is, not that I'm going to be spared of hardship, but I just thought, okay, we, we say, yeah, we're ready to have kids. Like it's just going to happen. Yeah. It's the next even, thing. I mean, this yeah. is what, this is what comes next. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if that's just like in the achievement based culture that we are brought up in. I don't know why that was so hammered into me, but I had to really kind of process through that and look at that and be like, Ooh, that's not like God's economy. And I don't know why I was subscribed to that way of living. I mean, I do. I'm an Enneagram three. I love achieving. So. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I'm can, a six. And it. so I do my best work when I'm in my three wing, but that's also when I'm like, most unhealthy. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> I'm like, man, I got a lot done. I don't need to talk to someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was, it was a confusing, messy, but very honest process. And when I look back, there were so many seeds that were planted in that period of, of me really wrestling this out with God that went on to to be the seeds of like a deeper faith and a deeper sense of hope now. So I'm so thankful for that season, as weird as that sounds. I'm moved by this because it's so important for us to understand that when we're experiencing loss, whatever that loss is, that's not the end. Mm -hmm. And you may feel that you are just surrounded by darkness, that there is no light, but we trust that we can take that next step. Mm -hmm. And it's what happens, I feel like, in the darkness during those times of intense suffering that shape us for the rest of our lives and open totally. our eyes to the needs around us. Yeah. And you talk about the five stages of grief, which I've always been intrigued by the five stages of grief because mm -hmm. I'll end up like actively doing them. I'll be like, I'll be like, I'm, t I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm fine. Everything's good. And then I'm like the next day, just furious. Mm -hmm. At everyone for everything. And I'm like, okay, okay, going through the anger stage. Cool. And then like, well, I don't really want this to happen. Okay, okay, you're going through the denial stage. But what does it look like to experience these five stages of hope? What what mm -hmm. are they? And and what would that look like for us? I think my critique of the five stages of grief would be that we think of them as they're gonna be linear, like it's gonna be a progression. Right. right. And it's often not. And I would say the well, same true, thing as yeah. Yeah, the same thing is true about the five stages of hope. However, I still think it's worthwhile to have language to name the season that you're walking through, if for no other reason than to be able to qualify it as a season. Because seasons have starting points and ending points. And like you were just saying, when you're in those times of deep darkness, you feel like each day is going to be the same. Like, I don't see a, a way to get any light in this tunnel of darkness but if you're able to frame it as a season and say, you know, like this is a season, this is a stage, whatever period of time you want to call it. I don't know, for me, that just helped put a little reminder in my brain of like, okay, this isn't going to be th this way forever. I'm not always going to feel these feelings so intensely. They may not go away, but they're not going to dominate all the other emotions that I'm feeling in such a stark way as maybe what's happening right now when I'm deep after loss, like in the thick of it. So the backbone of my book is is really situated in Holy Week, the last week that, that Jesus is on earth. So all yeah. the events leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. And I look at the emotional experience that Jesus and his disciples walk through. And then out of that, pull the five stages of hope. So they are expectation, which is this peak of human experience, emotion, excitement. That's what we see happening on Palm Sunday. For a lost mom, that's what you're feeling when you hold that positive pregnancy test. So you're lifted out of just normal status quo to all of a sudden, like your eyes are lifted, you're, you're full of expectation for a promise of the future, just as the disciples are finally like, oh my gosh, it's really happening. Our long-awaited mm. Messiah is here. Yeah. Then right after that is shock. And that's what happens um, in Holy Week when we see that Jesus gathers these same disciples around and says, I'm going to be leaving you. And for a lost mom, this is that moment when you have some physical indication 
the first signs that something is not as it should be with your pregnancy, that something's wrong. Mm. Usually in this stage of shock, there is a bit of denial. Like just as Jesus' disciples were like, no, really, you're not really leaving us. You're not really, you know, going to the cross. For many of us lost moms, it's the exact same thing. It's no, I think everything's going to turn out okay, or maybe they just need to run some more tests or what time it will improve, whatever it is. We don't want to accept that, that that bad news is, is going to be part of our reality. And that you even see Jesus doing that, like crying out before the father in the garden of Gethsemane saying, Lord, please help this to go another way. Yeah. Then we move into the third stage, which is despair. And that comes with Good Friday that, you know, Jesus on the cross it becomes clear that death has arrived. It looks like death has had the final say. For a lost mom, that's the moment when, yeah, death death has come into her baby's life and death is now part of her story. She's experienced pregnancy and infant loss. And that's typically accompanied by, you know, with that despair is that feeling of God forsaking you. You feel completely alone, just kind of at like this rock bottom pit of, of despair. Then the fourth stage is grief. For a lost mom, that's often, I think, the longest stage. And I correlate that with Silent Saturday and Holy Week. And the question that that's asked there, both from a lost mom and from the first followers of Jesus was, where is God? How on earth is hope going to return? Like the person that I had put all of my hope in, who I thought was the Messiah is now dead, has hope made a fool out of me. Yeah, how could this happen? Exactly. And I think it's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that for those first followers of Jesus, they didn't know that that the resurrection was on the horizon. And I think it's often tempting for us to to want it. We see this even in how the Western church celebrates Holy Week. You know, you go to a Good Friday service, you're typically going to hear somebody end the service with saying, like, Sunday's coming. For a lost mom, it just feels like that silence is kind of unending especially at times, especially because we live in a culture that is fairly silent on pregnancy and infant loss, as we've already talked about. You can feel like God's silent, like your friends and family are silent. Maybe if you and and your spouse are processing the loss in a different way, it can even feel like there's some silence in your relationship. And that's really hard. And then finally, the last and fifth stage of hope is active hope. And I call that active hope because as we were kind of fleshing out earlier, it's not this hope as an ideal. It's, okay, I, for the first time, am walking with an understanding of how hope shapes my future and my story. Because Mm -hmm. it is going to erase death from my baby's story. Mm. And that's correlated with Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to sit with that for a minute. I love how you use Holy Week. There are stages that are very easily identifiable. Hmm. And you talk about expectation, shock, despair, grief, and active hope. And I love how people love to throw cliches at people when they're going through something hard because they don't know what to say. So, you know, well, you'll have another one. Or, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window, which, you know, just stop, just stop. And I know you're trying to help, but like sometimes, What's that proverb? A fool is considered wise when he is silent. Hmm. I mean, I feel like sometimes that's my life first. That's a lot of our life first. <laughs> that should be something where it if you don't be. know what to say, <laughs> don't say anything at all. Like, you know, when yeah. you're a kid and you're acting the fool and your parents say, well, if you can't say anything nice, don't, don't say, say anything, anything at, all. at all. And if that's you don't right. know what to say, just take a deep breath and say, I'm here. Mm-hmm. I may not know what to do right now. You could tell the person that. People who are grieving, they will appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I love you. I am here. I'm going to go sit over there, eat some cookies or something. If you need anything, I'm over there in the corner eating cookies in a rocking chair. That's just what I'm doing. So, But I love how your experience and what you've laid out in your book, it goes from that initial joy to the shock, to the despair, to the grief. And then you're actively learning what hope is. Mm -hmm. You're kind of reconstructing hope. You talked about how it went from this ideal to this reality. Yeah, yeah. And I think we don't know what that 
means until we actually have to access it. Mm -hmm. It's like many of us have computers that we probably use it for 10% of what we can actually use it for. Right. And so in our faith, in our faith journeys, it's those really rough seasons that force us to actually consider what we bring with our new Christian operating system. Mm -hmm. That's so true. So when did you realize that your story could help others? Honestly, the very first time I shared it, I first posted it on social media. And just in the messages I got on Instagram and over text that same night, I had this kind of epiphany of like, because these were women reaching out saying, yeah, that happened to me this spring as well. I just haven't had anybody I can talk to about it. Thanks for your post. Yeah, so I found myself, I went from not knowing a single other person in real life who had gone through what I had to after posting that night. I mean, and this is one of the maybe redeeming things of social media. That night, having a small handful of women who had reached out to me and said, hey, this is a piece of my story too. And I set up coffee with one woman a couple of days later. She had just gone through loss as well. And, and she was somebody who was in my life. I just didn't know that that was part of her story. Wow. And then it just kind of kept trickling out from that week after week. And then I talked about it publicly when I was giving a message on a Sunday morning. And I had a lot of older women coming up to me. Mm -hmm. And and this really it has stuck with me and it really broke my heart. Some women in their 70s told me pregnancy and infant loss is part of my story. But nobody knows that besides my husband. And it was just a good reminder to me that, especially in the older generation, I mean, we think that these things aren't talked about now, but I know it was so much more silent back then. And yeah, it just broke my heart to know, man, these women have carried this piece of their story with them all of these years and felt like, okay, I can I can talk about nine-tenths of who I am. But this one chapter has to stay quiet. That wears on the human heart over time. And you feel like a piece of you needs to be hidden. And that has been a fuel for me in terms of creating Hope Again Collective and giving women a platform to share their stories because I would just love it if there's one woman that can share her story now and find that freedom that could prevent her you know, from carrying what feels like needs to be a secret all of her life. I just hope that, you know, we can provide that healing to another woman. And you're able to come as a guide and say, Mm -hmm. I've been there and this isn't, this isn't the way it should be, but I'm here. And you're able to help them also identify where shame or self-loathing can take root. Because if Mm -hmm. you're not talking about it and you don't feel safe to bring it up to anyone, like you said, this is something you're carrying the rest of your life. Women in their 70s never felt like they could share this. It was more of a throw it in your backpack, let's keep walking. And that Mm -hmm. stuff wears on you over time. It has to. It does. Yeah, I actually surveyed 400 lost moms. So moms who had either experienced miscarriage, stillbirth, or their baby had died in infancy when I was writing my book. And I asked a lot of questions about shame. And I was surprised but not surprised at this response the findings are that 84% of women who have experienced pregnancy and infant loss feel shame about that piece of their story. I knew it was going to be, you know, over 50%. I had no idea it would be that close to 100%, 84% of women. And I mean, as you know, like anything that we feel we have to keep close to the chest that we can't share with other people after a while, the way that I've seen shame work is it just takes root in different parts of your heart and you start to think, okay, there must be something wrong with me. It must be something wrong with my body. 100% of me isn't acceptable here in this social circle, in this culture, in this church, whatever it is. And that's just, it's, it, that feels so opposite of, of God's heart for people. And yeah, that can be so enslaving with time. And that shame can also not only wreck us within but it can wreck us without. It's going to impact mm-hmm. our relationships. It's going to overflow. It's going to drive a wedge. Sure. Yeah. I mean, 
how many families have we seen that have gone through ridiculously rocky patches after mm-hmm. infant loss? Mm-hmm. I've walked with people who were going through this pastorally, and I've seen the guilt and the pain that the wife faces as well as the husband. Okay. And what would you say to men Mm -hmm. who are trying to be there for their spouse, but one, they may not know how to respond, and two, they may be feeling like they're resented because they're like, oh, well, let's just get through because they can't necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times they put on their wife's shoes, they'll never understand what what happened. What would you say to them? And and this can often... The loss is already so painful, but then to have kind of marital fractures stem out of that, it is so painful and so hard and just compounds that feeling of isolation. I actually asked my husband to write a chapter of my book on this exact topic because I wanted it to come from his perspective. And it's something we didn't do great. We didn't do that well together after our loss. That was a point of contention. I felt alone. I felt like, yeah, why is he able to sing? worship songs in the kitchen when I'm, you know, in the other room crying and I'm not there. Is this not bothering him? Why is he able to to get on with life so much faster? And so we really had to work through that. I remember just one time saying, hey, it would be helpful to me if once a week you can ask me these questions and we Mm. we can have an intentional conversation about how we're both doing processing this loss. And he started doing that, but I had to tell him what I needed. So in that chapter that he wrote, he came up with this really great metaphor to compare it to. It sounds a little strange, but marathons and miscarriage. I'm a marathon runner and Mark is not. (laughs) And the first or second marathon that I had ran after we were married, it was the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. And I think it was the first one that Mark attended. We were both at the exact same event in time. Mark was on the sidelines at different points of the course cheering me on. I was on the road in the race, trudging along for three and a half hours. We had completely different experiences of the exact same event. Wow. So again, we were there. We shared it. We could both recall all the factual happenings of that day. But one of us was bearing the weight of that day. And the other one was was on the sidelines more as a spectator looking in. Was he feeling things on my behalf? Yeah, he was feeling excited for me. He could see the look of pain on my face as I got to mile 20. You know, he was feeling celebration at the end when I finished. But it was much different than what he didn't have the experience of what my body was physically feeling, the blisters on my feet, the mental, emotional turmoil that you're going through. Like, can I finish this thing? And that actually became a really helpful framework for us to be able to have conversations about our loss together. That put language to it. And I think that that was a good starting place for us. And I hope that chapter will be a powerful tool for other couples who are feeling like, yeah, we just process this so differently and we want to grow together through it and not apart. Well, I think you've just described something that is so needed in so many relationships, because when we are experiencing life with another human, it's very easy to say, yeah, I understand and I'm there. Why can't you just get past this? Or why can't you just move on? But we don't acknowledge the fact that, like you said, one person may be running the race, but the other's watching. And just because you were there doesn't mean you were really there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love how you took this vulnerable yet brave stance and you said, this is what I need. Mm Mm-hmm. Isn't that so critical in relationships? Because it's so easy to assume that people know what we're experiencing and what we need. But to actually vocalize it and say, this is what I need right now. Yeah. And that's especially crucial, I think, in the area of pregnancy and infant loss. Because so many families and friends, they want to be able to support, but they don't know what you need. And it is unfortunate that it puts the burden on the griever. but. I think if you are surrounded by family and friends who want to support you, you know, just just throwing out some one-time suggestions of what I need, you know, that will go a long way. And that is something that I've done as well. I've said, hey, 
I'm coming up on May 28th. This is the anniversary of when our baby died. It would mean a lot if you could somehow acknowledge our baby on that day. So telling people that a few months in advance, yes, it feels a little weird to do that, but I've gone past May 28th where nobody has acknowledged the date and I've felt that hurt, which has led to resentment. And then as years have gone by, I've said, okay, wait, I'm, I'm expecting something of someone that they don't know that I'm even expecting right? and realizing like, that's not necessarily fair to them. So I'm going to throw them some bones and say, Hey, could you put this date in your calendar? Could you pray for me that day? Could you reach out to me? Things that I like to do for other lost moms when it's their first mother's day without their baby. Maybe they thought they were going to have a baby in their arms by that day. I send them a card, a little candle in the mail, a text that says, I'm thinking of you. When it's Christmas time, especially the first Christmas past loss, you know, Etsy has so many great like angel baby ornaments and Even if you just want to keep it really simple, just get them a little angel somehow to say, hey, I'm thinking of your baby this holiday season. Things like that mean the world. If you ask the mom what her due date was and can remember her on that day, that just goes so far. So I know it can feel awkward at times, but I've learned that just as with any you know, strong relationship. Sometimes you just have to open a door to more honest communication and realize, okay, this person is not going to know exactly what I need and it's okay if I tell them. And within that opening up, there is this opportunity to be tended to. Mm. I recently interviewed Neil Salzman, who's the founder of the REST Initiative, and they work with people in ministry who have experienced either secondary trauma or they're carrying a load. And I asked him about self-care. And I know people, they can get frustrated over the semantics, but I think there's a core principle of Mm -hmm. making sure we just don't burn out, knowing our limits, knowing our boundaries, being able Mm -hmm. to recharge and actually do right by ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And as I was talking to him, I'm like, well, what does self-care look like? And he said, you can't do self-care without others. Okay, so I've been talking about this for a while in the anti-trafficking space. I'm like, well, we need this. You know, there's vicarious trauma and there's this. We need to talk about self-care. I don't think that light bulb has ever gone off for me. Sure. That we need to be tended to others. And what you're saying, even in your admission of this is what I'm going through, Mm -hmm. is you're giving your husband, you're giving your family members, you're giving those safe people in your life that you trust the opportunity to tend to you in that time. Which, what a stewardship, right? You're actually saying, I need you. I need your help. And I'm inviting you in to something that I'm scared to invite anyone into. Yes. It feels very vulnerable to receive and to ask for something because you run the risk of being let down. Right. But I don't know of a better alternative, you know? (laughs) I'm not sure there is one. And yeah, And as you are navigating this and as you are working with others who are experiencing this, how do you address triggers? Because let's be honest, you go to church, it's Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Because most churches don't think about those who have lost a child Mm -hmm. or experienced infant loss. They, They don't think about that at all. They're like, well, today's Mother's Day and we want to celebrate the moms. Right. How do you handle those triggers? I'm in a space right now where I have a little bit of privilege in that regard. My husband and I lead our church. So we have been afforded the space to be really intentional about Mother's Day. And again, that comes out of the pain of not experiencing, you know, Mother's Day well or the recognition of motherhood well. When we've been on the receiving end at churches in the past, I mean, I even think about it growing up. You know, you just would hear a Mother's Day announcement, much like you just said, and it's kind of this one size fits all motherhood box where we think, okay, the only form of motherhood is a mom with biological children in her arms. And it's just so much more complex than that. One thing we've done is leading up to Mother's Day, we had a survey. It was just up with a QR code. You know, there wasn't any pressure to scan it. And we had literally all the different categories of motherhood that we could possibly think of, including the desire in your heart to be a mom. There are a lot of women 
who are single in their 40s or 50s, yes. are part of our faith community that always wanted motherhood to be like a traditional motherhood to be part of their story. And they carry a very real grief. That's a very real thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's often not named. There are And people don't moms. assume that when they say, oh, well, this person's single. Well, I guess they just don't want kids. Exactly. Yeah. And until you've walked all. with somebody like that and you hear the intricacies mm-hmm. of their stories and you're like, okay, wow. Yeah. You, you're grieving losses of what you wish you had. And that's very the life painful, you always hoped for, right? Exactly. So that, you know, was one of the boxes. We have foster moms in our church, adopted moms. We have moms with, with children in heaven, moms who've been surrogates, moms in waiting, you know, who are trying and struggling with infertility, moms who are missing their own moms or have estranged relationships with their children or their moms. I mean, there are so many complexities to motherhood. So we invited any woman who wanted to, to fill out the survey and check any and all boxes that applied to her motherhood story. And then we made this really beautiful floral arch that we put out on our patio on Mother's Day. And each of those boxes on the survey was represented by a color of flowers that we put on the arch. And women and their families were taking pictures out in front of this backdrop. But we explained as at the start of the service, we acknowledged the complexity that Mother's Day brought. We prayed into the moms who carried both joy and pain over the day. And then we said, hey, as you go out to the patio afterwards and you you walk by the arch, take a moment to notice the mosaic of motherhood that's represented in our midst. And it ended up just being a really powerful physical representation wow. of motherhood. And I think for a lot of people, it may have been one of the first times that they realized, because if, if pregnancy and infant loss or any of these things that I just mentioned aren't a part of your story, it's just kind of not on your radar so much. But when you look at something that uses colors and, and has a chart that corresponds with it and you see, okay, wow, look at the beauty to this. Look at the complexity to this. There is so much more to be acknowledged and grieved and celebrated than just this one little cultural understanding of motherhood and thereby parenthood that we have as a society. Your story is so important because so many people are suffering in silence. And you talk about how what you went through not only shaped you to understand God's love for you and to love God, but it shaped you to see and love Mm -hmm. others in the middle of their pain, in that moment where everyone wants to run away, when no one knows exactly what to do because no two acts of suffering are the same. No two experiences, rather, of suffering are the same. But you and your story intersect the lives and stories of others. And so what advice or encouragement would you give those who are experiencing a loss like this in real time? Uh And those who want to help those experiencing a loss like this. Right. Yeah, if you're going through this loss in real time, first, I'm just so sorry that you're walking this road of suffering. And my greatest encouragement would be to somehow vocalize what you're needing, even if it's writing it down. If it's too hard to tell somebody what you need, put it on a note on your refrigerator. Text your friends. If if they're offering to help, it's okay to respond and say, yeah, actually, if you could swing by Target and pick up some groceries for me, that would really bless me this week. Again, it's going to be vulnerable to put yourself in a position of receiving, but that is what this season invites you into and to keep an open window of conversation with God. So many of us want to shy away from bringing our doubts and anger and frustration to God for various reasons could be your upbringing, whatever it is, but keeping an open window of communication with God and wrestling all of that with him, like he can handle it and it will grow your faith so much in the seasons ahead. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but in hindsight, man, I'm I'm so glad that I stayed in the fight with God because I just don't know what would have happened otherwise. If you're listening and you are somebody 
who is in a position of providing support to a family member or a friend who is walk is walking through pregnancy or infant loss. Simple things that you can do to really care for them. Send them a text once a month, even just to say, hey, I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of mm. your baby. What do you need this week? How can I help? And if maybe you know the person, they're not going to take you up on it. Get really specific. Hey, I'm making you dinner some night this week and I'll leave it on your doorstep. Which night is best for me to drop this off? Mm. Acknowledge them on Mother's Day or Father's Day. Acknowledge them around the holidays. It's okay to ask, hey, are there any important dates of your baby's story that I can remember? You're not going to offend them by asking because you don't already know. Put them in your calendar. Send them a card in the mail. Just send them a text thinking of you today. I said a prayer for you. Here's a scripture that I'm I'm meditating on today for you, thinking of your baby. It doesn't have to be grand for it to be meaningful. And anything you can do that's not silent, that is an act of of, of showing love to someone who's walking through pregnancy and infant loss, it will go a long way. Because people will understand the intention, right? They'll exactly. understand that you're trying to join them. Mm-hmm. Rachel, thank you so much for this honest conversation. Thank you, Raleigh. It was a gift. If you are interested in more stories like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. Also, if you want bonus content, you can click on the link in the show notes to access our new and improved weekly bonus podcast, More Mercy, where I dive deeper into each episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. I want to hear from you. You can email me at info at mercycast.com. This podcast is brought to you by Let My People Go. To learn more about how you can love your most vulnerable neighbors through your own vulnerability, go to lmpg.org. Till next time, have mercy on yourselves and each other.